History of the October 2nd, 1835 Come and Take It Flag Sources are at the end of the essay. Under the leadership of General Santa Anna, the government of Mexico was transformed into a military dictatorship ignoring the Constitution of 1824. The state of Coahuila did not cooperate with Santa Anna's plans, and the state of Zacatecas rebelled, but was brutally crushed by the military. One of Santa Anna's reforms was to reduce the number of the militia to one soldier for every 500 inhabitants, and to disarm the remainder. This arbitrary decree was a sufficient justification of Texas for her subsequent acts. Everyone who knows the Texans, or who has heard of them, would naturally conclude that they never would submit to be disarmed. Any government that would attempt to disarm its people is despotic, and any people that would submit to it deserves to be slaves. As Mexican troops began pouring into Texas, the people of Texas turned violently against Santa Ana. Committees of safety sprang up in every town. Newspapers hammered away for liberty and freedom. William B. Travis's letters sang of the hour that will try men's souls. Stephen F. Austin spoke that Santa Ana was destroying the people's rights, and Texas would resist and repel any armed force sent against Texas. As unrest increased, Santa Ana's soldiers began confiscating weapons, searching houses, disbanding suspicious groups that reformed as fast as they were broken up. A number of soldiers marched to Gonzales to confiscate a small cannon given them years ago to ward off Indians. The Gonzales Alcalde received the order to surrender the cannon, but stalled for time, sending runners to the surrounding area for armed assistance. Not long after, the Texans shed all pretense of ever surrendering the cannon and delivered the message to the Mexican army, I cannot, nor do I desire to deliver up the cannon, and only through force will we yield. Words of the impending conflict reached Stephen F. Austin, who sent letters calling for volunteers to go to Gonzales. One of Austin's letters read, quote, The Committee of the Jurisdiction of Austin has received the communication directed to the Committee of Safety of Mina by you in the name of the people of Gonzales under the date of the 25th inst, stating that Colonel Ugarte Chia had made a demand for the piece of cannon at that place and that the people in a general meeting had refused to give it up. You state that, from every circumstance and from information, the people are justified in believing that this demand is only made to get a pretext to make a sudden inroad and attack upon that colony for marauding and other purposes, in consequence of which those people request assistance to aid in repelling an attack should one be made. The present movements of the people of Texas are of a popular and voluntary character in defense of their constitutional rights, which are threatened by military invasion of an unconstitutional character. The people are acting on the defensive, and therefore, there cannot be a doubt that it was correct in the people of Gonzales, under this principle, to detain the piece of cannon which was given to them by the authorities of a constitutional government to defend themselves and the Constitution, if necessary. On this principle, the people of this and of every section of the country, so far as this committee is informed, are ready to fly at a moment's warning to the defense of those people, should they be attacked. Companies of volunteers have already marched, and more are in readiness, should they be needed, to repel an attack. This committee begged leave to suggest that, inasmuch as the position taken by the country, up to the present time, is purely defensive, it is very important to keep this principle constantly in view, and to avoid making attacks, unless they should be necessary as a measure of defense. Yours respectfully, S. F. Austin, Chairman of Committee, G. W. Davis, Secretary of the Committee of Gonzales. End of the letter. Eighteen men in Gonzales, willing and able to conduct an organized fight, removed all boats from the Guadalupe River and hid the ferry in a bayou north of town. Volunteers responding to the call to arms rushed to the scene, and the little Texan force of 18 mushroomed to 167 by October 1st. During this time, Sarah Seeley DeWitt and her daughter, Eveline, made the first come-and-take-it flag. It was Texas' first battle flag and the first Lone Star flag. To my knowledge, it is also the only flag that indirectly equates arms to liberty and that openly defies a tyrant's attempts at gun control. From across the Guadalupe River, the Texans dared the Mexicans to come and take it, echoing the words emblazoned on their newly created flag. 
On October 1st, 1835, Mexican Captain Francisco Castaneda arrived from San Antonio with something less than 200 men. Mexican General Ugarte Chia intended a show of force. Castaneda, blocked by the Guadalupe, demanded the ferry be restored and the cannon handed over. There was some parleying, a demonstration by the Mexican cavalry near the town, and considerable yelling and taunting by the Texans who continued to dare the Mexicans to come and take it. That night, the Texans silently slipped across the Guadalupe and formed a defensive square. Reverend William P. Smith rode into the square and, according to him, addressed the Texans thusly. Fellow soldiers, to cap the climax of a long catalog on injuries and grievances attempted to be heaped upon us, the government of Mexico, in the person of Santa Ana, has sent an army to commence the disarming system. Give up the cannon, and we may surrender our small arms also, and at once be the vassals of the most imbecile and unstable government on earth. But will Texas give up the cannon? Will she surrender her small arms? Every response is no, never. Never will she submit to a degradation of that character. Fellow soldiers, the cause for which we are contending is just, honorable, and glorious, our liberty. The same blood that animated the hearts of our ancestors in 76 still flows warm in our veins. Having waited several days for the Mexican army to make an attack upon us, we have now determined to attack them on tomorrow morning at the dawn of day. Some of us may fall, but if we do, let us be sure to fall with our face toward the enemy. Fellow soldiers, let us march silently, obey the commands of our superior officers, and united as one man, present a bold front to the enemy. Victory will be ours. We have passed the Rubicon, and we have borne the insults and indignities of Mexico until forbearance has ceased to be a virtue. A resort to army is our only alternative. We must fight, and we will fight. In numerical strength, the nation against which we contend is our superior, but so just and so noble is the cause for which we contend that the strong arm of Jehovah will lead us on to victory, to glory, and to empire. With us, everything is at stake, our firesides, our wives, our children, our country, our all. Great will be the influence over the colonies resulting from the effort we are about to make. We must sustain ourselves in the contest. This will inspire confidence in the minds of our countrymen. Fellow soldiers, march with bold hearts and steady steps to meet the enemy, and let every arm be nerved while our minds are exercised with the happy reflection that the guarding angels are directing our course. Let us go into battle with the words of the immortal Patrick Henry before the Virginia House of Burgesses, deeply impressed upon our hearts, when, with arm extended toward heaven, and with a voice of thunder, he exclaimed in the most patriotic manner, Give me liberty, or give me death! After Smith's address, the Texans resumed their advance toward the Mexican camp in the fog-shrouded dawn of October 2nd. They were sure Castaneda planned to attack this day. They might as well hit him first. Quietly, very quietly, they edged through the fog. With them was the cannon dug up from the peach orchard where Albert Martin had buried it. It was loaded with chains and scraps of iron. The Texan militia blundered into the Mexican pickets, but in the dark and fog there could be no war. Everyone drew back and waited until daybreak. The fog lifted suddenly as a curtain showing both forces drawn up on an open prairie with the come and take it flag flying. The Gonzales cannon fired and Captain Castaneda immediately requested a parley, asking why he was being attacked. Colonel Moore, commander of the Texans, explained that the captain had demanded a cannon given to the Texans for the defense of themselves and the Constitution and the laws of the country, while he, Castaneda, was acting under the orders of the tyrant Santa Ana, who had broken and trampled underfoot all the state and federal constitutions of Mexico, except that of Texas, which last the Texans were prepared to defend. Castaneda answered that he was himself a Republican, as were two-thirds of the Mexican nation, but he was a professional soldier of the government, and while that government had indeed undergone certain surprising changes, it was the government and the people of Texas were bound to submit to it. More than suggested to the captain, if he were a Republican, he should join the revolution against tyranny by surrendering his command and join them in the fight. Captain Castaneda replied stiffly that he would obey his orders. At this, Moore returned to his own line and ordered the Texans to open fire. 
There was a brief skirmish, and the Mexican forces immediately abandoned the field and rode back to San Antonio. Historian H. Yoakum's words in 1855 bear repeating, Everyone who knows the Texans, or who has heard of them, would naturally conclude that they never would submit to be disarmed. Any government that would attempt to disarm its people is despotic, and any people that would submit to it deserves to be slaves. We have had enough of tyrants seeking to disarm us so they can subjugate us to their evil schemes. History has shown us that those seeking to disarm us are indeed tyrants and the enemies of liberty. History has given us the flag that represents our refusal to be disarmed, and it has given us examples of men and women who fought and died for liberty. All that is left for us in the present is to muster the courage, intelligence, craftiness, endurance, commitment, and knowledge of history to carry the fight through to the finish.